Okay, we're gonna start with the uh, alleged poison of Napoleon, Count Charles Tristan Watson, guy who's always in debt, could not get a job. So uh, that's his motivation. And he was a very seductive person and that kind of stuff worked on Napoleon. <laughs> so that's what happened to him. All right. Here we go. Accomplished. Okay. Thing. Okay. A few moments after the dissolution of the second council, Prince Jerome entered the waiting room, having just arrived from the army, and begged me to inform the emperor of his presence. Although a young soldier, he had just performed more than could have been expected of an old general, 40,000 men had been rallied by him under the walls of Leon. The mention of this is no more than justice to the youngest brother of the emperor, whose name a race from the list the sovereigns deserves, at least as a general, to be inscribed upon the Arc de Triomphe as a testimony to his noble conduct in those days of misfortune, when men of the highest courage were filled with apprehension and the most powerful minds were constrained to yield to the force of circumstances. At Waterloo, he forgot his title of king in order to fight under the orders of a French general, and his division covered itself with glory at the attack on Hougoumont during the retreat, which is still more difficult. He proved himself to be greater than even in the field of battle, for by dint of opportunity, activity, and seal, he arrested the course of the fugitives, rallied them under the walls of Leon, and restored them to the command of Marshal Soule. Exhausted with fatigue and still bloody from the wounds which he had received, he came to apprise the emperor of the reorganization of the 1st, 2nd, and 6th Division of the Army, which when united to the 42,000 men under Marshal Grouchy would amount to more than 80,000 and compose an army with which he might commence in order to take a bloody revenge upon the Duke of Wellington. The emperor had no banker. He had never conceived the idea of being condemned by his destiny to create resources abroad. As a protection against the gratitude of France, in 1814, he left 400 million francs in the hands of the Bourbons, and trusting to the law of treaties, he set out for the island of Elba, taking with him 15,000 Napoleons. The remains of the army chest of the campaign, those 400 millions were personal property. He had acquired them by diplomatic treaties and from the savings of the civil list of Italy and France. They constituted his extraordinary domain and private resources. A former of these he used in order to pay what he called his debt towards the army. And upon it, he founded dotations. 175 millions of the extraordinary domain were employed in paying the expenses of 1813 and 1814. 205 millions still remain on the 11th of April when the Empress signed the abdication of Fontainebleau. Fees 175 millions in gold in the vaults of the Tuileries and 30 millions in the treasury of the crown at Orleans. Of those 30 millions, Nearly eight became the spoil of the Allied generals or the price of treason. The imperial civil list amounted to 10 millions. The capital, which had been accumulated at the 1st of January, 1814, exceeded 100 million. The emperor's will proved that his opinions with respect to the disposition of his property had undergone no change, for he says, I bequeath my private domain, one half of the officers and soldiers who fought for the glory and independence of the nation from 1792 till 1815, the allotment to be made pro rata, according to rank and service, 
and one half to the towns and districts of Alsace, Franche Comte, Burgundy, and Ile of France, as the compensation for the losses he had suffered from foreign invasion. The brother, King Louis, had set an example of these noble sentiments. He had laid down the crown of Holland in order not to be obliged to sacrifice that which he believed to be the interest of the country to the will of the emperor, he had preferred the retired life of a private citizen. So at the bounds of the empire, this is all very suspicious, to the royal honors which would have surrounded him at Paris. But the moment the Allies set foot on the shores of France, he claimed the honor of being a French citizen and hastened to demand permission from his brother to fight in the foremost ranks. I'm not sure about that. I arrived at the Elysee a few hours after the emperor. The first person whom I met was the Duke of Vicenza. Calancourt, coming out of the cabinet, the agitation of his features gave evidence of the state of his mind. And I had needed the assurance of our former intimacy to enable me to dare to stop him. A word I entreat. What is going on? All oh, exhaust, answered he. You arrived today, as you did at Fontainebleau only to see the emperor resign his crown. An impenetrable mystery protects the emperor's enemies. Oh, doesn't it? The leaders of the chambers desire his abdication. They will have it. And in the week, Louis the 18th will be in Paris. On the 19th at night, a short note in pencil was left with my porter. Now see the destruction of the army. The same notice was given to Carnot. The last telegraphic dispatch had brought news of victory, but both of us, at the same moment, hastened to the Duke of Toronto, Fouché. He assured us with all of his cadaverous coldness that he knew nothing. He knew all. However, I'm well assured, events succeeded each other with the rapidity of lightning. There is no longer any possible illusion. All is lost, and the Bourbons will be here in a week. For 48 hours, I had not quitted the Elysee Palace. Later day, the emperor had remarked it. So much so that he said to me, as I announced Prince Jerome, how is it that I see no one but you here? And it is perhaps to this circumstance that I am indebted for his determination to take me with him to St. Helena. Lucky for him, right? After Prince Jerome had taken his leave, the emperor was walking under the great trees in front of his apartment, seemingly deeply absorbed in meditation, when stopping suddenly before the glass door of the antechamber, he tapped gently on the window and made a sign for me to join him. Where is Semonville? What does he say of all this? I know not, sire. Tis now three months since he quitted Paris. He is at his estate near Coutances. But your mother's in Paris. He writes to her. What does he say? Ah, oh, I've not seen her since your majesty's arrival. Without saying anything more, he walked several times up and down the path. I was doubtful whether I ought not to retire. And slackened my pace in order to allow him to pass on, he turned back. Petrin hesitates to accompany me. Jouet refuses. You will accompany me, will you not? Yes, sire, I answered without reflecting. An instantaneous emotion produced by his voice and his looks ruled my whole being. At this moment, we heard a great tumult under the terrace of the Alizé Bourbon. It arose from two regiments of tirailleurs of the guard, which were formed of volunteers from among the workmen of the Faubourg Saint Antoine. They were defiling in disorder in front of the garden at the head of an innumerable column of people calling loudly for the emperor to place himself at their head and lead them against the enemy, requesting him to suffer them to execute justice on the traitors who spoke of sending commissioners to the headquarters of the enemy in order to sell France again, as they had done in 1814. Yeah. All right, now we're going to... Las Casas in Italian. So, who's Las Casas? He's a strange little man. <laughs> Followed the point of St. Helena. Very mysterious <laughs> where he came from. And uh, seemed to be a super fan of his. But there's some questions. Well, he seemed like he really did care about Napoleon. So we're trying to figure out What's going on with these people? Does not look right. There it is. Okay. So let's get started. The Emperor of the Abbey, an animal, 
restaurar y al exterior y todo yo que podía meterlo en armonía con el otro corte de ropa. Más en el interno había siempre el pensiero en estar y la forma en que la novela construyente. Con tal intento restablecer y cercoli, mantener y serrar, me forró no pio de nombre que de facto y luego de presentar la pio minuto particularidad de una vera tauleta es la scocchezza que potevano conseguir questi momenti sotto l'imperador e arrano spesso realmente a ricevere nel mattino e a concedere nella sera quegli impiegati della sua casa, i quali attentavano ordini diretti da lui o che avevano il privilegio di farsi presentare in questi ori speciali. Medicivamente, gli imperatori rimisi in usanza le particolari presentazioni e le ammissioni alla corte, ma invece di concedere un tale favore ai soli privilegiati della nascita, e gli pigliò a regola la fortuna insieme all'influenza e ai servizi prestati. Così l'imperador creò titoli, il cui distintivo risaliva agli antichi tempi del feudalismo, ma senza valore reale e ad uno scopo puramente nazionale, senza pregativa e senza privilegi. Ed essi titoli erano alla portata di tutte le nascite di tutti i servizi, di tutte le professioni. Egli li chiamava un utile ravvicinamento ai costumi della vecchia Europa di fuori ed un inocuo trastullo per lussingare in molte vanità nell'interno. E però che osservava Egli quanti bambini anche di merito, non bambolagiano più volte nel corso di una giornata. Nella mira stessa, l'imperatore concesse decorazioni e distribuì croci e cordoni, ma insicchi di fonderli soltanto fra le classi speciali e privilegiate. E allora, a tutta la società, ad ogni maniera dei servizi, ad ogni specie, che lì. E per un privilegio esclusivo, forse nella persona di Napoleone Pio, ne accordo, e un maggior pregio a questa Roma, ai calcola a 25.000 per avventura il numero delle decorazioni della Legion d'Honor, da lui distribuite. E il desiderio di ottenerli diceva e gli andava continuamente crescendo ed era divenuto una specie di furore. Dopo la campagna di Wagram, egli iniziò all'Arciduca Carlo e per una squisitezza di galanteria che gli era tutta propria. Gli viò Precisamente la croce d'argento, quella ci è, nel semplice soldato. E l'era, diceva l'imperatore, la pratica fedele e spontanea della massima ora accinata, ciò che faceva di lui un monarca veramente nazionale e che avrebbe reso la quarta dinastia, una dinastia veramente costituzionale. Così notava egli il popolo delle più infime classi ne possedeva il segreto istinto nel quale proposito raccontava come nel suo ritorno dal incoronazione d'Italia e nel vicinanzi di Lyon la popolazione al dosi per vederlo lungo le vie li presi il chiripizzo di salir solo ed a piedi la montagna di Tarara. Aveva il glivietato a ciascuno di tenerli di 
otro mes calando sin a la fora, se acostó a una vecchia. Y que es si que más significa si tanta presa de pueblo. Y la crisis esposa que el emperador estaba por pasar de la so di che politicato alquanto le son giunse. Ma è la mia buona donna. Voi avete fatto altre volte il tirare il capetto?